All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, from my uh, voice, obviously. I'm very delighted uh, to have you all here. I know it's uh, late in the afternoon, and uh, um, you know the refreshments are waiting for us. Uh, this is the last panel, so uh, we'll try to keep it very um, exciting and hopefully uh, not uh, make you sleep. Uh, I am Tushar Kutarki. Uh, I am uh, a product manager on the OpenShift team at Red Hat. And um, uh, this is the panel discussion on AI ML on Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, we have, I'm going to say it a couple of times so that it sinks in, we have a new SIG uh, that uh, we are creating in OpenShift Commons that uh, Dan mentioned. Uh, so you can go and obviously I'm going to plug it now and at the end, go and sign up. Uh, on OpenShift Commons uh, for this SIG, um, you know, if you're interested in this topic, uh, especially towards the end when, you know, you heard from this esteemed panel here. So, so the logistics are, I, I thought, you know, we, we do some introduction to the topic uh, and to the panelists for about 10, 15 minutes. Then we'll get into the main discussion itself, um, ask some questions, and then I'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions um, for like, say, 10 minutes and then we'll wrap up, right, so with some more plugs. Does that, does that make sense? All right, cool. So a brief introduction to this topic. It's very exciting, right? I mean, uh, uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, and machine learning uh, is already touching our lives, uh, be it, you know, uh, you know driverless, or, 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 or driverless cars or automobiles, uh, be it uh, personal assistants like Alexa and Siri or um, be it, uh, you know, Netflix recommending your favorite movie or Pandora, your favorite music, uh, or uh, be it optimizing your optimal uh, energy usage with uh, Nest thermostats. I mean, there is some AI in there. I mean, um, I mean, it's it's really already there, right? I mean, uh, we are saying it's new. What's next? But in some ways, it's already there and affecting our lives. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to talk about this today. Uh, my personal favorite, uh, quote unquote, use case really was uh, this thing I was reading that they are using uh, basically pattern recognition and image recognition uh, to reunite families that might have been separated like place in, in place like China for 20, 30 years. Uh, based on photographs, like, oh, I have a photograph of, of my child when, and, and they were six years old, and now 30 years later, I mean, it's only possible uh, because of AI, I mean, machine learning. And I remember doing pattern recognition 15, 20 years ago in grad school or whatever, and it was so much more rudimentary. And so, um, anyhow, so uh, I'm very excited about this. Um, the one thing is, um, you know, AI is not easy, right? I mean. Uh, AI has been talked about for a long, long time in academia. Uh, so uh, why has it not happened so far? It's uh, because we didn't have things like cloud and we didn't have things like data, big data. So uh, it's certainly building upon a couple of uh, huge technology trends, but also those technology trends and those use cases, as you know, are also moving very fast. So AI is building upon that. So it is complicated. Uh, it uses a number of languages, and we'll talk about that. It uses a number of frameworks. Uh, it uses uh, a number of, it is very computish, uh, computationally intensive, resource hungry. Uh, so you really want to optimize the use of it. Um, so, uh, and it touches a number of different roles. I mean, data scientists obvious, being an obvious new one, right? Uh, so, uh, so we have all this complexity, and what I thought we would do really is the fact that you know, one of the advantages that we have, I mean, we're going to talk about, we talked today, but over the next few days, we're going to talk about containers. I mean, simplistically putting, hopefully we can containerize some of this complexity away is how I'm looking at it, uh, for the, some of this complexity that we saw. Uh, containers also are lightweight. Uh, they are fast and efficient, uh, and uh, they enable uh, you to, they are portable across a hybrid cloud footprint. So. Uh, so, and Kubernetes and OpenShift obviously have emerged as really as uh, you saw in Chris Wright's keynote 
uh, you know, have really emerged as a very powerful container platform. Uh, and in fact, you might all, all call it the de facto platform. So, uh, so uh, it is great uh, to have to, uh, to to moderate this panel on AI, ML, and OpenShift and um, uh, Kubernetes. So, with that, let me start with the introduction of our panel here. Uh, I'll start with David first. Uh, David uh, Arenchuk is a product manager at Google. Uh, he is uh, uh, he's a, a manager for Google Container Engine uh, and has been shipping software for 20 years in various roles. Uh, he has been a founder of three startups uh, and has had strengths at Microsoft, uh, Amazon Chef, and now obviously at Google. Uh, David now is focusing on ML uh, uh, on Kubernetes. So, and he has some very exciting news that he'll share with us uh, in a bit. But uh, David, say hi to everyone and uh, add something that I might have missed. Out. Ah, that's uh, that's 20 years worth of uh, summary right there. So uh, <laughs> it's pretty good for me. All right, all right. Okay, so next we have Chris Orold. Um, he is a product manager at Anaconda. Uh, he is uh, a product manager for the data science platform. Uh, he, is, uh, ha he has expertise in distributed systems, uh, data engineering, and computational science workflows. Uh, he has a PhD in civil engineering from UT Austin. Uh, and um, prior to that, uh, uh, prior to Anaconda, he was at National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Uh, Southwestern Research Institute and uh, University of Texan, uh, Texas at Austin. Chris, say hi, and uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for um, having me here. It's an honor, and um, our headquarters of Anaconda is about five blocks over, uh, so this is our, our home base here. Uh, we have about 100 employees, and if you're not familiar with Anaconda, it's um, leading open source uh, data science distribution. Uh, we have um, just about five million unique data science users around the world. Windows, Mac, Linux, and um, it's uh, a lot of the foundational pieces of data science, machine learning, and gateways for folks to get into things like notebooks and machine learning with TensorFlow. So excited to talk about that here today. Five million, that's a big number. Very nice, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Chris, for that. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have Matt Farrelly. Uh, he's a senior engineer and architect from Red Hat. Uh, he was, he is the founding member of a project, Red, uh, Red Analytics, which he's going to talk about in a bit, uh, yeah, which is about which is about open source data analytics, uh, ML platform based on Apache Spark on OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes. Uh, he was one of the founding members of Sahara, I could say that, right, uh, on, in OpenStack, which was the OpenStack big data processing project. Um, uh, he was involved in the University of Wisconsin uh, Condor project. For some of you who might know that, that was like the high performance throughput computing project, uh, as kind of early pioneers in distributed uh, cluster computing. Matt, want to say hi? Hi, Check everyone. Um, and that was great. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. I've known Matt for several years now, uh, including that University of Con uh, Wisconsin project. All right, so. Let's dive right into it, right? Uh, this was the introduction, so um, let's dive right into it um, so that we have a common understanding. What I'd like to do is, what does AI and ML mean to you? I'll start with you, David, and we'll circle around, or you can go in any order, but what does it mean to you? Scope it a little bit. What is it? What is it not? Um, Absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I always think it's funny and somewhat uh, not great when people joke about you know AI coming to murder us all, and and I am as guilty of that as anyone. But please, there are many many people in the world who do not understand AI and ML, and like to hear it even as jokes uh, from the people who do know, not so great. So uh, please let me plead about that. Um, when I think of uh, ML, I, I basically think there are. Uh, three categories of problems that it really unlocks that, that you've never seen before. Uh, the first are where things are hard today, but they're, they're tractable. You could at least potentially do it. And so that might be, you know, if you had a million pictures, you know, identifying what pictures had dogs in them, you could do that today, you know, with your standard algorithm. You could do it today with humans and so on and so forth. It would just take a really long time. Then there's the second category, which is, uh, there's problems you know how to solve, but effectively they would be impossible to solve uh, via computers at all, right? And that would be something like uh, beating Go, 
for example, right? That's something where we know the rules of Go and theoretically you could beat it, uh, but no, you could not use standard compu computational techniques today to, to you know, beat Go or be better than humans um, at, at that problem. And then the third is where we can't even really describe how to solve the problem. We know what a solution looks like or when we've succeeded, but there's no algorithm that we could come up with to solve it. And that would be something like, you know, identifying uh, cancer in radiology, for example. Um, we have kind of a generalized heuristic, but if you got 10 doctors together, they might still disagree. Yet, even now you have um, AI, or excuse me, ML, being able to uh, look at this problem and make an assessment and, and be better than, than humans are today. So, and, and it's still improving even beyond that. So th that's all to say um, the, the three commonalities of those problems, and that's where I say the definition of ML is, uh, ML is uh, being able to uh, uh, solve a problem without necessarily understanding exactly the methodology to get there. Um, and that's not great, right? We actually should probably be able to understand it, um, but that's what we're unlocking today, and that's probably the biggest thing that you're seeing. Yeah, when I think of um, machine learning, if I initially scope that to a library, say in Python or R, it's just a collection of algorithms or statistical um, um, algorithms that can be applied to different data sets. So the sort of, you know, import a library, run it on some data, that's the beginning of machine learning, but I often think of it on an implementation timeline, how do we make that useful for other people and how do we democratize that? So the following, the next two big stages I think of are you have a library, it has some statistical functions, you do things like model selection, there's you know, dozens of steps beyond that. Once you have something sort of working, it works on my machine, how do I share this and make this useful for the rest of the world to build and improve on uh, to match up with open source philosophy? And I think things like standardized um, formats, uh, whether it's serializing data or sharing models in efficient ways, allowing other people to build on that modularly um, is a big deal. And there's, when you start working with larger and larger groups, whether that's a, a, a foundation or an enterprise uh, team, things like uh, reproducibility, governance, traceability of those models becomes very important. Um, then deploying that out so people don't have to follow you know, dozens of steps to get it up and running. It's very easy to get up and running in any environment, HPC, cloud, on-premise. Um, and then beyond that stage of, of deployment and, and usability um, really comes the consuming of that, right? So we actually want our greatest audience to be able to consume that in a interactive visualization or just a browser, right? So there may be a complicated technical stack underlying that and it all starts at the library and infrastructure level, but we think a lot, and, and as I've watched different industries evolve, it's all been about model, about consolidating these models and APIs on a common framework and common tool set to really democratize the, the audience, the people building and consuming. So to me, machine learning is those libraries plus the reproducibility plus the collaboration at that human scale, like global scale in many different industries. Uh, thanks. That was very interesting answers. Um, I, I take kind of more of a, an engineer approach to it. I think of AI as a, as a large body of, of research that's been ongoing for, for many, many decades. Within that, you have things like knowledge representation and machine learning. And then within machine learning, you have things like neural networks and deep learning and whatnot. So I kind of think of it from a, from a structured perspective that way. When it comes to the kind of like the scope or the impact, it's more of how our AI, AI machine learning is giving us ways to kind of interpret the world, interpret all the data that's, that's around us, and going, giving us new ways to interact with the world and interact with, with other people. Um, Tishar, you gave some examples of, of AI machine learning um, apps that people may interact with on a daily, like may interact with the de on a daily basis if they could like buy a Tesla or something like that. Um, but in, in reality, AI machine learning is, is really ubiquitous already. I mean, Google search is an example of this that's been, been around for a very long time and is really part of people's lives at this point. Um, on the kind of like, I think you said, what is it not? Um, I, I like to think that it's, it's not a 
it's, you know, I'm going to kind of violate David's comments a little bit, but it's not the, it's not the destruction of, of humanity, and it's also not the savior of humanity, and really it, it's also not a, a salad dressing, although people might, yeah. given, given the fact that it's so hyped right now, people might say it is. Yeah. You know, one of the stand things you hear also in this context is, oh, it'll kill all the jobs, and it's, I think it's not even that, because just the example of driverless cars, I mean, driverless doesn't mean that you can sleep inside. I mean, you know, for the next 10, 15 years, you still have to pay probably some attention. You know, yeah. you may not. And it, we've, it had, we've had many kind of like revolutions of these things that yeah. people think are going to destroy humanity or whatnot. And spoiler, we're still here. Yeah. And things are, things are for the most part getting better, getting whatnot. So we'll have the, the same thing with AI as soon as a lot of the, the hype settles down and the reality of what people can do with it and how it interacts with it, you interact with it in your life actually becomes more clear. I, I'd like to uh, uh, support that. Um, I, I actually just want to say one one thing on top of that, y uh, yes and it, which is um, it, it won't kill us. It won't kill all the jobs or anything like that. Uh, but only if we, all the people in this room and the people watching, are responsible and think about you are all technology implementers, creators, and so on. Please do think as you're doing this stuff. Uh, don't rely on someone else doing the hard work and, and being aware of that. Um, but uh, yes, I, I totally agree that, that it by itself will not do it, but we do need responsible um, implementation. Yeah, ultimately it's, it's a tool, and we, we need to use that tool in, in good ways. Very good. That is a, there's a good introduction to that topic. So. Um, Next is, is, is what I was going to ask each one of you, and you can go in any particular order, but like, what is a favorite use case for you? I mean, uh, like something that you're like, get excited about, oh, I want to make this work today because it'll solve this problem. And so what gets you excited um, you know, in this? I mean, just one example, maybe multiple examples, it's up to you. Who wants to start? I'll, I'll can start on this end this time. So um, my, I think my, my favorite example, my favorite use case or whatnot is somewhat a selfish one. Uh, so I've uh, never been particularly good at foreign languages. I took lots of foreign languages in high school and college, but never really kind of like immersed myself in an environment to actually use them, um, to actually communicate with people. And I think the, the, the translation capabilities that are coming out right now are really going to make it much easier for people to communicate and much easier for me to communicate with people that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. Um, for me, uh, a little bit of my background is in civil engineering and specifically like life safety systems, building protection systems. So really kept an eye on uh, building systems and building integration as it comes together with many different manufacturers. If you look at a building, inherently it's sort of boring. It's a boxy structure with rooms. But as soon as you start recording and logging information like energy usage, temperature, occupancy, and you put all of that together and aggregate it, you actually get a really beautiful picture of how that building behaves as it interacts with people and people interact with it. And at a city scale, it helps uh, things like emergency responders. And um, it's a nice example of how to bring something that was formerly static sort of online and um, something that we can monitor over time and become integrated even with many, many different subsystems of many different types. So um, to me, the complexity of that and how we wrap that all up into a, a, some useful metrics for people is, is a pretty awesome example of a, of a smart building or a smart city. Uh, and to David's earlier point, some of this insights, we don't even know what we're looking for. Right. And algorithm, I mean, machine learning will help us. David. Um, I, I, uh, I spend all my time in ML, so I'm always astounded at, at everything. I'll, I'll try and uh, keep it super brief. Um, I'm going to, uh, I have a talk tomorrow. I'm going to give away some of the stuff I'll talk about. But one of them that I love is, is from Google. Uh, Google, as you may know, we have a lot of data centers. We hire some smart data center people. Um, and um, there's this term in, in data centers called uh, PUE, power usage efficiency. You want it to be as low as possible. Uh, and it means like literally the number of cycles per power. And we hire really good data center engineers that understand this and try and roll it out. And so we looked at it and they're like, oh, all these fans and water and cooling and things like that, they, they kind of look like signals for ML. And so we um, hooked it up 
And the power usage efficiency went like this. Bam, 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 bam. ML on, down, ML off, bam, right back up. Mm. Uh, and literally, and we're very public about this, we save 15% on our power just by using ML against these data centers. It's just such a phenomenally large number that, that you can't even believe. Uh, and again, it's not, it's not something you could just wire up instantly, but it was uh, really, really important. Uh, the, the second thing I, I do want to say is um, one, of my, one of the most interesting areas of ML today, particularly use case wise, uh, something called um, uh, GANs. Is anyone familiar with this? Uh, generative adversarial networks. Basically, imagine uh, this, the incredibly simple summary is, is you take two AIs, or excuse me, two ML frameworks, models, and you pit them against each other. So the first one tries to figure out a solution, and the second one tries to figure out something that breaks the first solution. You just force them to go against each other. Uh, it's just unbelievable, and you're getting things, and this helped with the translation, and, and it's just, you see this all over the place, because for us right now, we're entering this phase where we're actually having trouble coming up with exactly the right data to you know, face off against the model. Um, and, and I remain very, very optimistic that this is the area where you'll see the most creativity coming um, because literally we, we can't even think of the ways to break the model in such a way that the model can get better anymore and, and you're seeing some really interesting stuff there. Very cool, very cool. All right, so um, what I'll do next is kind of try to get more deeper into it. We, I talked earlier about how this all nice, uh, sounds very uh, exciting, but it's also complex and it's not easy. So starting with David, uh, one of the things that I was going to ask is, what are some of the challenges in AI and ML that you see today, and uh, how is Kubernetes playing a role in it? And maybe this is a time to talk about one of the things that you want to talk about. Um, sure. So um, generally, I, I, I see a couple of, of really big things. Um, uh, the first is really the approachability of ML. Uh, uh, today, if, if uh, I sat any of you down for any non-ML practitioners and, and walked you through what the average ML person did, you'd be shocked at like how absolutely tribal and back of the envelope and, you know, oh, maybe I'll tweak this number, you know, the way it is right now, uh, which is really, really disturbing for a, a bunch of, of CS folks who are like, well, there should be a standard process for going through this and exploring. And I think we'll get a lot better there. Um, but part of it relates to the second big problem, which is real transparency and understanding, being able to probe into a model. So if I run an application today, um, uh, you know, I can you know, attach to the, the process and see exactly you know, what's being called at what time and you know, what's using memory and things like that. And, and there's not that kind of level of introspection into model and how it's performing right now, um, which is not great. Uh, that's kind of a, a second major effort. Um, and, and both of those kind of relate to the third thing, and, and this is something I'll, I'll talk a lot about in a little bit, but it's basically one of the biggest problems is, is that um, it's not easy to roll out a standard ML deployment. Everything is, is very bespoke. Um, you kind of piece together whatever works and how you would like to approach it. Um, and that's not great because that means that that standard tooling doesn't work anymore. You now need to not only create this, this stack, but then on the other half of that, create a set of tooling that supports your stack and lets you introspect and lets you understand what's going on, lets you auto-tune and all those various things. Um, that said, that's where I hope um, that Kubernetes can help, uh, help us. Uh, today, people generally create their stacks from the bottoms up all the way down. They, they understand exactly what version of Python, what libraries they're running, uh, what you know, networks, all these various things. Uh, and that's just too much for the average data scientist to approach. And the, the data scientist shouldn't have to think about that. And that's where Kubernetes has really changed the, changed the game. They, they create this wonderful standard abstraction over the, the infrastructure that you're running on. And not just create an abstraction, but actually create rich objects that allow you to interact with various components of the, the platform. And, and to your point, like help you uh, wire a bunch of services together. So um, I, I, I remain very optimistic. And like I said, I'll talk about it in just a little bit, uh, what I think the future looks like for uh, ML on Kubernetes. Definitely. So in terms of um, data science with Python and R, uh, Many of our users, if you sort of climb the stack over the past couple of years with our users, 
Anaconda solved the problem of, I need to get Jupyter up and running with TensorFlow with all of its Fortran and C dependencies as quickly as possible across Windows, Mac, and Linux. So that was a good thing. The next question was, now I want to share this analysis or this model or this server or this visualization with my buddy on a different operating system. Or so they need to, to install system packages, allow these things on their firewall, get these other libraries in. Oh, they mismatched a version of this. So Docker uh, was a, a nice addition to something like an Anaconda Python distribution uh, where sort of where the open source Conda package manager left off in terms of environments it took over and said, oh, now I can bake everything into an image, and it's very portable. And then the next layer was resource management, scalability, orchestration, and that's where Kubernetes came in. Because what we found about a year ago was that our users were building amazingly different things and amazing things with Anaconda, and the last mile was, now what? Now how do I deploy this thing out? So data science deployment, you can read blog posts of you know 20 easy steps to data science deployment, right? Spin up a web server, do a reverse proxy, set up your SSL certs, da da da, hook it with authentication, on and on. Um, but what Kubernetes did for us was to create an ecosystem that was a common interface and a way for to take what we had already built with the package manager, with Docker images and containerization, and give us that last mile. Where now someone using Python 2, Python 3, R, Lua, Julia, uh, Fortran C dependencies, any of that doesn't matter can all play in the same space. They no longer have to worry about uh, things clobbering around another an environment. It all just works at that abstraction layer for these people who just want uh, microservice. They just want their model to run and share that and run alongside others so they can build on top of it um, without having to go through that over and over and over. So this has been very important for enterprises adopting things like machine learning and ML, uh, large organizations working together, um, and, and really democratizing environments, right? The fact that they can deploy to the cloud or on-prem without changing anything is, is a game changer. Um, that means we don't have to switch APIs every single time we want to deploy somewhere. So really, in the last year, deployment has data science deployment um, from anywhere from interactive viz models to, to machine learning libraries um, and all of the above has just become that much more perva pervasive through things like Kubernetes, containerization, isolation, and orchestration. So I'll, I'll be quick and I'll, I'll build a little bit on what was said here is I think. Um, and also, I mean, I mean, touch upon data, right? Like one of the things and uh, how data. data is so important for all this. And well, so, so quickly, I think Kubernetes has done a tremendous job uh, really providing the, the API, the interface that's expected by operations people, by sysadmins, by developers. Um, it's really it's really codified a lot of their best practices uh, over many many decades of, of experience there's with with AI machine learning there is a shift in the way that the system the systems operate the way that they're built that kubernetes is going to have to adapt to to some extent it's and there's there's an understanding that I think is really being formed will be talked about um, with with David later is how, how data scientists operate and what expectations they have, and then what expectations the things that they build have on the infrastructure that they're running. Uh, a, a concrete example that, that we usually use is thinking about bit rot. Thinking about bit rot from a, a developer perspective is you've deployed some, some piece of code and rot is something that happens over long periods of time, usually with some sort of dependency changes or some sort of input changes and things fail, and things fail in a fairly drastic fashion. And the infrastructure, Kubernetes, understands how to deal with systems that, that do that. Um, AI machine learning systems are inherently more, more statistical based. They're, they're not, they don't give you that, that clear things that fa um, failed. They just start performing suboptimally. And detecting that suboptimal performance, being able to have infrastructure that can respond to it, is something that is really is really going to be more and more important to, as we try to take the data science artifacts that are produced from the bespoke systems and put them onto something that an enterprise really under, really understands. So it's going to be a challenge for Kubernetes, cool. not an insurmountable one. 
So, um, Matt, let me start with a kind of a new line of questions in some ways is, like, tell us a little more about what Red Hat is doing in, uh, in this space and uh, how the, some of the projects that you are leading, what are you are contributing? Uh, do you want to walk us through that? Sure, just um, really, really quickly from my perspective, yeah. uh, purely from my perspective, um, really think Red Hat's getting into this conversation about AI and machine learning in, in I'll say, Two important ways, three interacting with our with our customers. One is that we're really consuming best practices for AI machine learning. We're understanding what it means to, to build these applications, to use these applications to improve our business and whatnot. So that becomes really important to be a practitioner of these things. Uh, the second thing we're doing is we're starting to have the conversation as to how do we influence, how do we give back to what these best practices are? So um, Chris mentioned the, the RAD analytics work that's going on. This is, this is a, a, an output which is starting to form some of the, the understandings that we've, we've built up over the, the last number of years using AI, using machine learning. So I think that's, that's really key. And then the third thing if I were to add into this is um, we're actually putting out uh, services and software for our customers that have that don't have a big AI machine learning stamp on them because in the in the end it's a tool to do something but are actually like powered by AI and machine learning. Chris mentioned um, two earlier today. He mentioned the Red Hat Insights, also mentioned the work that's happening with OpenShift IO. I'll add a third which is actually kind of like intelligent routing for support or getting customers to solutions uh, more quickly using AI and machine, machine learning. Cool. Um, do, who wants to talk about some of the work that is happening? I mean, we talked a little earlier uh, about the Kubernetes resource uh, uh, management working group and some of the work that is happening with respect to GP GPUs and en enablement of that. Uh, and, and some of the work that is happening in Kubernetes. Who wants to talk about that? I'll throw throw a couple words. So, like, there's there's work happening with the the, um, the those working groups around figuring out the the kind of like hardware technology that is becoming more and more important for these machine learning algorithms and making sure that those, the, that hardware is, is exposed and accessible to the algorithms that are actually running on top of, of OpenShift. There's the, I think it's the performance sensitive pod, um, application pod uh, work that's but, happening to really kind of like make sure that Kubernetes has a very solid foundation, not, in, not just in the, the ops APIs, the developer APIs, but then in the, the hardware support to make it worthwhile to use those APIs. All right, so um, um, I, uh, the next question really was, uh, what I was, I was going to tee off really was this way, right? So if, I mean, one of the things that everybody is thinking and like everybody makes these decisions, right? Like why should we care now, right? Um, so can you address that, especially like, you know, how data is important and even if you decide to do something today, you know, you might not have collected the data, how difficult data is for an organization to con collect internally, but also extra from outside, and what's the dynamics there, as well as you know, how that's important for AI and ML. That's fine. So, um, I mean, I, I think that we are awash in data in a way that we've never been before, um, you know, literally, we are collecting data from every movement, right? Every device, Fitbit trackers, uh, you know, the sensors in this room, repeating heat and, and uh, thermostats and so on and so forth, uh, all the way up to the, you know, largest possible, you know, number of queries, user behavior and things like that. So we're at this phase where it's just absolutely transformative relative to data um, and and I think there will be a really important transformation that goes on. Um, uh, you know, I, I, a lot of researchers out there nowadays um, would argue that, that actually with, with all the hardware investments and all the data investments, we have everything that's necessary to make these great decisions. 
Uh, the problem is it's not available in a format or a way for us to consume it or our algorithms are just wrong and too slow and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that's a really valid point. I think probably the biggest problem today, and when you think about your average pipeline and the average number of, uh, the amount of time that anyone spends building a model uh, versus everything else that's involved in building out ML, uh, you know, building a model is very, very small versus ingesting, getting rid of outliers, uh, feature engineering, transforming it, moving the data around in a pipeline, regular way. Uh, let alone after it comes out, you know, are you tracking it? Are you being responsible security-wise? All that good stuff. Um, I think a lot of this stuff is gated on the process and the pipelines rather than just, you know, the, the actual implementation of building your model. I think uh, a couple of interesting things we've observed in the last year happening in the data world, uh, one of them is related to data virtualization, right? The data is going to live in different places. We know that it's going to live in different formats. And that's something that data science, both at the machine learning library level and at the operational Kubernetes level, that we, we know as a fact. And, have, and folks have worked really hard to build in connectivity, whether it's Amazon S3, Google Storage, on-prem, uh, HDFS, different connectors are, you know, it's very important that those, that they have high value to be maintained over time, right? That's, that's a lot of hard work that goes into that. Um, and th things like standard data formats and best practices for things like uh, Apache Parquet or Columnar data stores, these have become, uh, so from the, from the Python and R perspective and data science, right, Python has connectors to just about every data format and data source you can imagine. It's part of the Python data science anaconda philosophy, right, to just connect to all sorts of remote data and compute sources. But what really happens is we're seeing users exercise, you know, for a given problem, it's best to use Parquet stored in this particular data store for performance reasons, for training reasons. So we're seeing a lot of that as we see these be, get exercised in different verticals. And uh, another thing interesting we've seen in the last year is, you know, generating synthetic data when training, right? So just sometimes you just don't have enough data to get started when you need to do model selection on natural language processing or image classification. And we've seen really interesting use of generating huge data sets in parallel um, that can be used uh, for the training the iterative process. And then you can bring in the real data on a, on a rolling basis. Um, so between those two things of data format, data storage, especially many remote sources, um, I think that it, it, is, it is hard work and it's something that was recognized up front in, in Kubernetes and containers. And it's going to be hard work to continue to maintain but we're gonna learn the high value connections of things like standardized data formats um, as the training, uh, whether it's image classification or NLP, it, it's orders of magnitude difference in performance when you use the right tool for the right job with the right data format and the right data storage. So that's all starting to come together. I think we're learning a lot to that together, uh, even in the open source and, and cloud activity that's going on. Cool. Um, I was going to go to the Q&A next, but before that, I wanted to give you each an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about something that's happening here at the conference, or a plug that you want to do for a announcement that you want to make. So, uh, David, you want to yeah, start? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, well, my plug is for my talk tomorrow. Please come. Um, but I do want to talk about something that we're doing um, just between everyone in the room and those on Facebook. Um, we're, we're launching something which is designed to solve exactly a lot of the problems that we've talked about here on stage. Uh, it's called Kubeflow, and the idea is it is a standard ML stack for running ML on top of Kubernetes. It is not about re-implementing all the great hard work that's out there in the world, TensorFlow, XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, anything like that, or any of the UIs or any of the transformation tools. It is really about uh, much in the same way that Kubernetes didn't go and re-implement a database uh, serving tool or something like that. It just allowed you to take that containerized tool and spin it up in a very elegant way, uh, but not just elegant, uh, but also portable and very scalable. So you could deploy it to your laptop, you could deploy it to a GPU rig, you could deploy it to a cluster, um, all with the same command repeatedly. Um, and that is something that we're very, very you know, happy to get out the door because 
This is something that we hear so often from customers. Oh, geez, you know, I wanted to go down ML, but I had to, you know, completely reimplement that stack, or I had to build it myself, or my, you know, my data scientist had the wrong version of Python, and so everything failed. Um, our goal is with Kubeflow uh, to be this very uh, open framework that the community can come together um, and help collaborate on. Uh, so we're kind of being quiet about it right now. We love your thoughts. Um, but the GitHub repo is open, and, and please join in. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, my plug is for Anaconda. What else? Um, if uh, I guess how many folks in here have downloaded or used Anaconda? So if you haven't, it's a free download, Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's up to a thousand libraries for Python and R. Any area you can think of, image classification, uh, natural language processing, NLTK, GenSim, Jupyter Notebooks, and machine learning, uh, we've been very busy adding more and more libraries, TensorFlow with GPU support, and the nice thing is you just Conda install it, it's all pre-compiled across Windows, Mac, or Linux, makes it very easy to use, free to use on any of those platforms. And then we have Anaconda Enterprise, which you can sign up for a 30-day trial of. It's pretty much a manifestation of uh, data science platform with collaboration, authentication, security, uh, but the, it's all powered on the underlying Anaconda distribution and the Conda package manager. So if you haven't used that um, and you're tired of, of living dependency hell and, and dealing with uh, Fortran C library, system libraries, and um, when doing machine learning, try out Anaconda and um, let us know what you think. Cool. Matt? So I'm going to bookend you here with uh, Kuplo on the other side, too. Um, I think one of the one of the really important things that we should be looking at when it comes to something like like Kubeflow and what's what's um, Dave is going to talk more about is there are there are many many organizations out there who have been producing uh, bespoke solutions for building these pipelines, building these flows, trying to put them into production, trying to address how data scientists work, trying to address how operations folks work. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of engineering work that's gone into this. There's also a lot of engineering product work that's gone into this. You see uh, cloud vendors are producing solutions for these almost on a weekly basis, uh, if you look over the last, the last few months or so. What's really missing in the space right now is a place where a community can form to really not just have a, a single, uh, single vendor or a single instance position on what this flow should be, what the interfaces should be, how things should fit together. Um, so I'm really hoping, looking forward to, to Kubeflow as a potential place where that community work um, can, can really happen. Cool, and, and, and if David forgot one, so let me plug it uh, for him. There's a uh, uh, Birds of a Feather BOF session at 7, 7.30, something like that Correct. in the evening? Uh, tomorrow at, uh, I, I think, five, I think it's early. I think it's, it's 5.30, but oh, it's okay. on the schedule. It's uh, Birds of a Feather, ML on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm going to be there to talk about Kubeflow, but I, I want to be clear, it is the uh, organization, the community that comes together and wants to talk about whatever they want, that, that they take it in that direction. All right, thank you. Um, we'll come back to you for one final thought, but we'll do some Q&A now. So I'll open it up and then... Right. And I'm going to put in one more plug, too. If you go to commons.openshift.org, um, halfway down the page, there is an ML um, working group that we're starting up on the OpenShift Commons. So if you're interested in this and you want to get involved um, and hear more about the best practices and lessons that we're learning around Kubeflow, please um, sign up there as well. So do we have any questions in the audience? I know it's towards the end of the day. There's one right next to you. One right up, which is that was too close. Uh, hi, I was just wondering if there was anything uh, in the predictive analytics space in particular that you're excited about that you uh, feel is really interesting? Uh, I mean, I, honest to God, I, I, I see something almost, <laughs> almost every day. Um, I think the thing that's, that I, I have, I approached this, uh, and I'm not an M, you know, ML PhD by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I came at it like, you know, the ML space as being like, well, how hard could it be to take an existing model and transfer it to this new space? And, and what I've found is that, unfortunately today, it is highly, highly bespoke. Like, you could have a predictive model that, you know, is 98% accurate in the movie theater ticket space that doesn't work in the 
baseball game ticket space. And it's just kind of crazy, but that is where we are. Um, so I guess the things that I'm most optimistic about uh, are things around transfer learning, really. Um, where you, uh, for those that don't know, basically imagine your, um, uh, your model is, I don't know, 100 neuron or 100 layers. Uh, you strip off the last five layers and then you retrain on a, a, a much smaller set of data. Uh, I think that's, that's very exciting to me. And, and there's a lot to do there, to say the least, but that you know, reduces the total amount of data you need by you know, a factor of 100 or more uh, often. And, and that's quite compelling. Yeah, for me, it's uh, a little bit more rudimentary, but it's exciting to watch our users going through the process of you know, dropping their batch jobs in terms of uh, models that are constantly training, constantly running instead of sort of this daily or weekly thing. Um, that's exciting because there's a lot of sort of wasted time that goes into these the, the iterations and the daily iterations as opposed to just bringing something online and having it run sort of um, on an ongoing basis. Um, and the other part that's interesting, again, it's not cutting edge, but it's watching our users refactor the way that they work into microservices. So what would have previously been a monolithic um, image classifier with a UI built onto it with a very specific declarative way of doing something, let's say recognizing images or edges, uh, is now completely different in the way we're seeing our users in the past year sort of build a specialized API that just does the classification and a specialized front end for that that's modular that can swap between the different backends. So actually watching that roll out into the larger masses and not just the, the, the developers, uh, the bleeding edge developers is actually really nice to watch. And it lets, it lets us sort of focus around the best tool for the best job instead of a monolithic approach to everything. So we're starting to see those projects get deprecated and sometimes broken up to microservices that are actually healthier than the original monolith. Um, so it's exciting to watch that happen as, it, as things get adopted more and more across the industry. So just um, so two quick things then. Uh, one is I want to add on to David's comments about, about transfer learning. Uh, it's, people need to watch this space as the, the real, the vast majority of the complexity that's happening in data science and um, data, data engineering work, model design and whatnot, and being able to reuse that uh, as a developer is gonna be hugely empowering. So that's, that's really key to, to watch out for. To, to your question about something happening in the predictive space, um, as, a, as a user, I'm really excited about more work that's happening around uh, kind of like news curation or really curation of my RSS feeds. Uh, there's more and more work happening there. It's just, it would save me lots of time in the morning. Yeah, I mean, for, at least from a Red Hat perspective, to add to that, right? I mean, something that you mentioned, like using the digital exhaust, like logs and metrics and stuff like that, and how do we make our uh, systems much more uh, smarter in terms of scaling or uh, in terms of even a better fault tolerance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is something of very, a lot of interest for us from a Red Hat perspective. There's one more question. Oh, right there. Go ahead. Hi. So I've heard a lot of people complain of uh, how when technology advances, humanity regresses. So how, as technologists or advocate of technology, are we supposed to educate people to use this to our advantage and not the opposite? We really need to become data literate. We need to under, understand what the sources are. We need to be teaching people uh, to understand how, what data is, how data is used, and what the, the potential is. Uh, and, and really, as from a personal perspective, also looking at understanding what our, to use the term, the, our, data, our um, data exhaust is in the, in the world today. And I think if we, if we can teach people, if we can educate people about data, how, to, how it's used, how they can use it, and then what they're actually producing, we'll, we'll have the building blocks for not regressing. I think a big, piece of, of empowering uh, both the producers and consumers of, of uh, ML and AI is about transparency, reproducibility of the models and the analyses themselves. So I think, I think a bad example is treating something as a black box, you know, it only runs in a certain environment and we don't really know why it works so well, but it works great and saves us money. It's not a good approach. You know, I come from a, a sort of civil engineering, very hands-on physical engineering. I think ML to me is the same. I, I often relate to it in a way that 
when I think about the hyperparameters or distributions that are going through, I want to see those all the way through. I don't ever want to see a step that, well, I don't really know what happened to that distribution or hyperparameter, but it looks good. You know, that, um, I think, you know, as, as producers, we need to be very, very careful to document and, and be very open about the stages that are going through, the layers, and what intentionally each layer was put in for in a, in a given analysis. And then as a consumer, we need to ask those questions of, hey, this is a really nice model. It's, it performs, outperforms the others by 10%, but why? Can you re reason through why, whether it's a, a physical model reasoning or a hyperparameter tuning? Just having that global picture often lets us uh, not focus so much on one well-performing local model, but really get a big picture of the context. Uh, it, you know, especially depending on the industry you're in, in finance or healthcare, that can have really big impacts. So um, reproducibility, transparency of the models, I think, are the two key things um, as, a, as a citizen data scientist, right, to, to always exercise and, and either produce or ask of things that are being produced. Um, I, I, I think those are both terrific answers. I, you know, um, I, I think if I was going to um, kind of generalize it a little bit, there, there are two key things that, that the, these both fa factor into. Is any, anyone familiar with Chaos Monkey? It's the Netflix tool that they use to actively kill machines randomly to, to tease out issues. Like, um, uh, technology is not neutral. We need to be aware of that. We are technologists. We need to be aware that it is not neutral. It has a positive or negative effect. And it is up to us to be our own chaos monkeys for the technology we roll out. We need to be probing in every possible way and, and be mindful that, hey, have I checked to make sure that this model that I rolled out doesn't um, actively bias against a certain population, whatever that might be? Have I checked to make sure that the, you know, what the edge cases look like here? And hey, is this an area? That, let's be clear, you are not reinventing anything, I promise you, right? Uh, if you develop a, a loan analysis system for looking at someone's credit report, there is literally 50 years of uh, sociological research showing how uh, minorities and people of color and, and women were biased against through standard methodologies, like long before ML came along. Go, be smart about that area and the ways that it impacts you, even prior to technology, and be thoughtful and mindful about entering that space again. Uh, and, and don't try and be an expert in it either. You will get it wrong. Go find an expert. And, and chat with them and, and understand how you can be better at it. So that, that's largely it, but to be honest, we will never educate the population. We need to be doing the educational work on our own and, and, um, and, and you know, it really have a hard line about this. Great answers, next question. Yeah, I guess I'd follow on, you guys were talking about it from a producer of, of ML technologies and I'm thinking about it from a consumer of ML technologies in terms of um, is there development or, or some kind of transparency uh, guidelines that we can use to figure out, okay, when a, when a ML model makes a certain decision, uh, why is it making that decision, and is there a way that I can tell if I'm consuming, like, you know, uh, Google's version of this algorithm versus uh, Microsoft's version of this algorithm, you know, which one is going to give me the, the appropriate transparency, and how do I trace it to make sure that the decision is not a biased decision, uh, you know, on a on a case by case basis, but also on a software by software basis. I, I'll give a very concrete example of that. I use Google Maps a lot, and I always wonder how many times is it experimenting this time on me. You know, so and then that that goes to the consumer uh, transparency. Is that I mean, will we know that you are being experimented upon this time? No, you will never know that. Yeah. They, they, that's their goal is to, and I say that as a Google employee, but any AI, right. like, or any solution, and this is not AI or ML related, they're just gonna experiment. They wanna see whether or not a new thing works. So that's, that's the pro not the problem. I, uh, you know, I know technology is not the solution or panacea or anything like that. My hope is that, and I know this is my job to pitch my new thing, but my hope is that by creating standardized ML stacks with somewhat standardized reusable components, we will develop standardized reusable transparency tools for that. Um, I mean, the, it is impossible to look at, uh, uh, you know, for example, there are two very, very popular image recognition models right now out there right now, ResNet and, and ImageNet. They're both very, very successful, and they both perform better than human 
right now. Uh, you could not use transparency analysis tools that you built for one with the other. Uh, they, they're just completely different layouts and models and so on. And so um, my hope is that by, by building some of these standard tools, uh, you can do it. But let me make a pitch out there. I would love someone to build Chaos Monkey for ML, meaning you don't need to introspect into the model, right? Like you could build this and say, hey, I have a set of multiple different population types as data that I can feed into your model and get the results back on the other end. And it doesn't have to be real humans, they can be totally anonymized, but like if at the end your model comes out and it's biased, then you're like, hey, something bad is happening here. And, and it doesn't, that didn't give you the transparency that we all should demand and literally there are a hundred PhDs working on introspecting into models today, but at least then we have some awareness. And so I, I will pitch that and I will endorse and find Google engineers to help you if you want to lead, you know, that kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. but, but test cases where it's not, like where we know what the population source was. It's, the population source is not made available to the model, right? The, you just hand these objects in and some results come out the other side and that, that test on the other side looks for bias against populations. So, so two, quick thing, two quick things. One, um, going back to my, my definition of what AI is, what machine learning is and whatnot, um, we need to understand that machine learning, uh, there, there are sub areas in machine learning. Uh, neural networks, deep learning uh, capabilities is, is one particular area that's, that's being applied a whole lot right now. And it specifically has interpretability uh, concerns associated with it. There are other approaches that are that are better in some um, use cases, worse in, worse in others, like, like image recognition, speech, things like that, uh, but are interpretable. Um, when it does come to uh, neural networks, I think we need to extend your, your question as to, is it, it's not just the focus on the model, but it gets more to kind of like what David was talking about, is it, it's the focus on the model, the, the code that was associated with it, and the data um, that, was, that was used to drive it. And we'll, we'll, we don't know, it. we don't have an answer now, but if we can start capturing these things, smart people will figure out how we can get an answer to it. I think one more question. Um, yeah, David, to your point, I think we had Chaos Monkey like 10 years ago in the financial industry. They all used AI and they never saw it coming. But um, what I wanted to ask, where do you think will be the main contributions of AI when we talk about things like the self-driving data center? Um, when I listen to your answers, David, I think you're hedging a little bit that you say right now the complexity is too high, we have to focus on abstraction. Um, will you foresee a future where maybe the scheduling is um, predictive that you already know, okay, to assure the performance of a workload, this is where I have to put it, I can provision more stuff, or how, how do you see this play out? Uh, sorry, so if, that, if that's what you took away, I apologize. I don't think the complexity is too high at all, right? We have existence proof of us solving that problem. I think, in my opinion, right now, the problem generally relates to um, the approachability of using AI or ML for your data center, for your self-driving data center, that is too high. And by that I mean literally the interface between a model and your system is broken. It's highly bespoke, meaning Either I have to rewrite my model in some very specific way, or I have to build some crazy feature engineering tool to translate the data that I have into something that's actually usable, or then I have to, like, even if I get answers, you know, am I, do I have the correct feedback loop so that as I take action on my answers, it's feeding back in properly? Like, all that is broken right now. Uh, it's, it's less, a, like, it's very approach, or it's, it's very implementable. The problem is, is that there's no standard. And so what we're, all three of us on the stage are, are contributing towards this, this stack, and again, I, I don't want to you know, hold this up as the end-all, be-all solution, but my hope is that we're able to develop some standards as an industry around stacks, around yes. ways to ingest data, ways to sp spit out answers, getting feedback loops, all that kind of stuff, um, where it does it. And, and to be clear, like I said, we have data centers that we do it at Google. We have internal services that literally self-drive our data centers. So it, it's absolutely possible. It's just how do we um, make that available to everyone? 
to democratize. That's the word that was used. Everyone's democratizing. I'm, <laughs> I'm done with that. I want to feudalize. <laughs> All right. With that, I think uh, this is. Uh, this is a great uh, panel discussion, I thought. I hope you all agree. Thanks to our panelists. And uh, I hope to see you all over the next few days, including the a few sessions that we have.